Welcome back. I hope that was uplifting. So, this next panel, led by Sue Beely, Executive Director, Story Money Impact, aims to examine the intricate blend of climate, science, and story. Let us explore the symbiosis of climate, science, and the magic of storytelling. And this has come up a couple of times today, scientists um, communicating story, and we as filmmakers can help that. So please welcome Carmen Enriquez, producer, fi producer, filmmaker, Real World Media Inc., Real World Films Inc., Dr. Jennifer Jackson, ocean scientist and film festival co-founder, British Columbia Environmental Film Festival. Charlene Sanjenko, founder and filmmaker, impact producer, media visionary, Regen Media. And Farhan Umadali, filmmaker and educator, Vovo Productions. Thank you all and enjoy. Hi everyone, I'm Sue. I know some of you are just upstairs in a workshop while the rest of us were down here having a pretty powerful experience watching that incredibly well-programmed film. Thank you so much for bringing it to us and letting us have the opportunity to watch it. Um, the feeling in this room watching that film and right now to me is such a different resonance than this morning. This morning we were having such interesting and important conversation about the mechanics of what we need to do about climate. And I feel like during that film, we were deeply, deeply into the story and the emotion of what we can do about climate. And this is where, when we talk about content and how content can impact us about our own motivations, our own inspirations, our own what is possible, and how we can move together as a culture is an incredible tool. Um, I printed out something here that I just want to share that is not my words, but it's from a report called The Superpower of Media from an organization called the Responsible Media Forum. And this is the welcome of this report, the opening of the report from a woman named Christiana Figueres, the founding partner of Global Optimism and the former executive secretary of the United Nations Framework of Conventions on Climate Change. So I'm just gonna read this for you. With great power comes great responsibility. As we prepare to beat climate change, what has yet to be done is a culture of climate optimism. The belief that the world will be better, the confidence that we can make it, the recognition that the action required is urgent, exciting, necessary, and full of opportunity. Culture is just as important as science and politics, but neither scientists nor politicians are in a strong position to define it. Scientific reports and political manifestos set out the long-term direction, not the motivation and excitement that we need here and now. The 2015 Paris Climate Agreement represents the integrity of human spirit. Despite its ambitious goal of reaching a global economy of net zero emissions by 2050, we are currently witnessing a gap between current efforts and actual requirements. Between our greenhouse gas emission efforts, or sorry, greenhouse gas emissions and the planet's tolerance for those emissions. Politicians and climate scientists alike refer to this as the emissions gap. I, the author of this, Christina, I prefer to think of it as a culture gap, a gap between what we were doing and what is possible, and in fact it is necessary on the other. Does that make sense? A gap between what we are doing and what is possible and in fact necessary. No industry is better positioned to close this gap than the media industry. Together, we can inspire more enlightened behaviors, amplify the stories that need to be told, question business as usual, campaign for change, and finally, normalize sustainable living. This is our call to action, folks, and we have incredible people doing this work, and we need to do it more, stronger, better, louder, everywhere, together, in all different forms. 
So with that little blurb, I'm going to ask each of these beautiful panelists who are incredibly courageous in their work and how they spend their time to just take a wee moment to just introduce yourselves and just sort of say, where do you sit in this sort of um, environment of climate and story? And Charlene, will you please um, kick that off? Thank you. Thanks for the honor to be here. I'm Charlene Sinjenko. I'm from the Splatching Band of the Shuswap Nation in Enderby, BC. And I now reside on the Squamish, for, uh, Squamish lands on the Sunshine Coast. Um, my life has brought me to this point at this, uh, in 2023 as an indigenous uh, impact producer and media visionary who is seeking to lead a movement to the return of the sacred art of storytelling and the appreciation for what, what storytelling really is and really can be. And I, I cannot, uh, what Sue just read literally was <laughs> some of my, my speaking points. If we actually don't believe it's possible, um, it's not really too much to, to left to be to be said. So, for me, the the act of story, and for those of us who just witnessed, um, yeah, it, so much more to say. But I'm going to leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thanks, Charlene. Carmen, welcome. Let's hear your voice, please. Hello there. My name is Carmen Carmen Enriquez. I am originally from Chile. I am an immigrant. Um, I've been working on television for the last 20 years or so. I work in documentary. Um, documentary is the art form in which I can contribute to this cause, I suppose. Um, um, the kind of work that real, my company is called Real World, Real World Films. The kind of work that we do is, is um, you know, taking um, um, an indigenous perspective on the environment to uh, highlight stories that are um, in, in, in the process of making change, creating change, active change, and highlight those stories with, um, I guess, with the skills that we, we have. That's, that's about it. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you. Jennifer, you're kind of new to this crowd, aren't ya? <laughs> Please share with us who you are and your little bit of your background. Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I'm an ocean climate scientist and I focus on coastal physical oceanography or the physics of the ocean. And my day job is that I work for Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And in my background, I've studied the Canadian Arctic Ocean, uh, the British Columbia coastline and the coastal waters of South Africa as well. And I studied ocean warming and the loss of oxygen. And it's been really overwhelming. Um, you know, you see all of these changes happening and you see that so little is actually happening in, in the world to stop the changes that you're observing. And a few years ago, um, my friend Bejman Hadabi, who's in the audience today, is a filmmaker. And um, we were talking about all of this climate anxiety. And he said, why don't we start an environmental film festival so you have more of an outlet? <laughs> so you can you know, try and take some of the stories that you see in here and bring it into the general public where there's just this gap of knowledge. Um, and so yeah, we created the British Columbia Environmental Film Festival about three years ago now. And uh, it's been really rewarding. It's been really nice to sort of get out of my little science bubble and meet so many new and wonderful people. Welcome. Great to have you here. And thank you for starting that festival. <laughs> Farhan. OK. Hi. Um, my name is Farhan. And I'm a scientist turned filmmaker. Most of my films are about, these days, connecting the dots between climate change, industrialization and colonization. And um, I also teach filmmaking, so I believe in uh, sharing knowledge. Um, I run a program with StoryHive uh, called the Empowered Filmmaker Program, and we've trained over 425 Indigenous filmmakers across BC and Alberta. I believe in uh, sharing that knowledge so they can tell the stories they need to tell. Because uh, if you look at the heart of climate change, it's all the way back to the genocide of indigenous people around the world, right? And we need to get back to that living in balance, especially now. 
it's more prevalent than ever, right? Thank you. I'm just going to take a second to take my moderator hat off and just also put another hat on to place myself in this conversation. Um, Melanie introduced me as the executive director of a nonprofit charity that was actually started by Tracy Friesen, who's in the audience here, um, called Story Money Impact. And I'm just going to tell you what Story Money Impact does. What we do is we solely focus on working with social and environmental justice documentary films and building strategies and pathways to get those films in two places and in front of audiences where we think there is potential for that audience to help make a difference to the issue that is represented in the film. So it's a very strategic kind of focus. Um, and we always, after our screenings, have an engagement activity, whether it's a conversation, a workshop, or something. So the film is like the amuse-bouche for bringing people together into an issue area so we can then do the work locally with a particular group to help figure out what's possible. So that's Story Money Impact, and if anybody has any questions about it, you can ask me or you could ask um, Trace. So I might come up with a few comments in this conversation that um, orient to that organization. Okay, folks. So um, I think we have a little bit here about how you found your way into this work. Um, if you want to comment on that's great, but um, what I'm really interested in is is the what do you think is possible? And I'm going to acknowledge that there's nobody on this panel from the fiction world, and so we're going to do a little daydreaming um, in a minute and pretend to put our fiction hats on and say what we think is possible also in the fiction world. But um, again, if you just want to think of like your way into the work, you alluded to that in your introduction. But what do you think is actually possible from where you sit? Um, and I'm actually going to start with Jennifer because I think there's a pathway there that is so undertapped that we need to open up, please. Yeah, I mean, every year, you know, tens of thousands of scientific papers are published and probably less than 1% actually make it into the general population. So there's this huge amount of knowledge out there that nobody knows about and nobody hears about. And what I would love to see moving forward is that there's a much closer relationship between filmmakers and scientists so that some of those stories could come into the general public and become part of our, our knowledge. Um, you know, we're constantly being faced these days by misinformation, wrong information, fake news, but as scientists, we can help to address that. And uh, yeah, I think that there's a real need for us to work together in our two different communities. So that's what I would love to see in the future. So I'm just gonna paraphrase, some sort of gathering of creators and scientists building relationship, knowledge sharing, and then potentially seeing what could flow out of that, be it documentary, be it fiction, be it whatever, but a real knowledge sharing effort. Absolutely, yes. Mm, that could be totally fun. <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of organizations in here that may want to sponsor that. <laughs> <laughs> you can come talk to us if you yeah. like. <laughs> uh, Carmen, what do you think is possible? I mean, you've just done this beautiful series, and what do I think? You've done you've done a whole like legacy of work. But what do you think is possible? Mm. And tell us, just maybe share a little bit about the work that you've done. Um, documentary series. I just actually Melina is right here. She's the host of a series we completed, which is Power to the People, which is a stories about communities that are changing the way they bring energy into their communities. And um, by focusing on the people, we are able to talk about the technologies that they're using in a, in a human way. But uh, what is possible? I think what's possible is to for us to be um, more aware of the art form so that we are not fooled <laughs> by um, the lack of information that's out there so we become better at better at understanding what's being presented um, in terms of the language and the power of, 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 of the tools that are being used to disinform us. So part of that is becoming even more, because obviously you are all filmmakers, <laughs> even more aware of, of um, how media works. We can use it to our better advantage for our own rather than being utilized on us. And, and can you just speak a little bit about what you've seen as part of the impact from the Power to the People series? Like what has it 
by creating that series and sharing it, what has actually happened or changed? Uh, first, what happens um, has to begin with us, the filmmakers, the because um, the change begins with ourselves, and that change is reflected in the work that we produce. It is an intensely personal process to get to know the communities, to understand what moves them, to understand why um, they are in the predicament that they are, and then to try to um, put their, you know, uh, add that echo to their voices so others can hear it. Um, um, that's just what documentary is. It's 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 you become a tool for the story. You are not um, and you are you are the instrument of the story, not the story. So um, it it really is about finding affinity with communities, affinity with the story that you want to tell. And once you find that affinity, um, you find it as something that is true. And when that truth hits the screen, okay, now you can feel that you've done what you were hoping. So. Thank you. Charlene, what do you think is possible? And I know you've got your fingers in a whole bunch of product, uh, projects and maybe just to talk a little bit about, about a few of them, but and what, do you, like, what is the impact you're trying to have? Yeah, th thank you. Um, Sue, I think I'll answer it maybe from three different hats for a moment. So if I pull out the furthest, um, sometimes when I get overwhelmed um, with life, um, I first pull out to a teaching by my indigenous teacher, Winnick Jean, and he reminds me sometimes, Charlene, you know, we've only been on this trajectory for the last 100 years. So what are you doing today to make sure that tra trajectory is shifting? So I kind of try to get beyond myself and, and, and think a little bit bigger picture. So in that, I think, okay, in 2023, what is possible? Well, we have never been more connected to technology than we are right now. Everybody knows where their phone is right now, I'm guessing, that who is in this room. We know where our phone is. That's our first question. Oh, where's my phone? And so I actually think, you know, to Sue's reading at the beginning, um, media is the, the single most powerful lever for change of our generation. And as someone who has worked in the social impact space for the last two decades, that's why at 53, I'm in a new career in media. I'm an emerging filmmaker, but I understand social impact and how to weave uh, transformative opportunities in with story. Um, so that is, that is part of the possibility I see, just the fact that in 2023, look at the privilege we have. Look at the privilege for a minute and how are we using that privilege of technology. Um, the other piece I want to say is I actually started my career in the investment services industry. I left that industry in 2000 and 20 years ago the phrase impact investment didn't exist. It seemed like a pipe dream. And so um, I'm in a, an emerging industry that we call regenerative media, much like the film we just watched. We cannot create the so solutions we need at this time from a place of despair. Innovation and hope go hand in hand. So as folks who are passionate about sustainable solutions, we must come at it from a truly innovative, hopeful place. We can do that through the power of our imagination, which is really our closest, our closest connection as human beings to our return to spirit. So those are just a few of the things that I'm most passionate about. The possibility I'd most wanna step into next is actually short form media. That's what we're watching. And that's where my, you know, my passion of, of brand building and brands on board and, looking at advertising dollars, much like we started to look at investment dollars differently 20 years ago is probably the biggest nut I'm looking to crack. Oh my gosh, okay, so many things I wanna double click on. I want us to come back to the conversation about length. I want us to come back to the conversation about how we get money to do this work. And um, I wanna come back to this conversation about innovation, hope, and imagination. But first, Farhan. What do you think are the opportunities? Like, where, where are you 
what where's your mind going yeah i'm just reflecting on what everyone's saying and i remember back in 2016 i was um invited to shimshan territory to make a film to help stop a outrageous pipeline that was going to be built through their pro their their lands um that was going to destroy the Skeena River. It was a Petronas LNG project. And that film was a volunteer one that helped fund their the indigenous resistance to actually have the supplies they needed. There were lots of community screenings I worked with, actually Tamo on that. And that started the journey for me as a documentary filmmaker. But I was the one asked to come over there because they didn't have the skills and they needed to be humanized somehow. That their land was going to be stolen, destroyed, etc. And so for me, um, from that time, I actually applied for a Story Hive grant, and I realized that I could be, yes, we helped stop this pipeline, but we have to go beyond stopping stuff. What if I could l just bridge this technological gap with the original storytellers of our lands? For me, that's a huge opportunity, because they can continue on and tell the stories they need to tell and protect the land, water, do so much more than one person that I could, you know, I'm limited in what I can do. We're all limited. But if we can share our knowledge, now we're talking about creating a revolution, right? So that's what I think are possibilities, sharing knowledge. Okay, so sharing knowledge, loveless, and sharing imagination, loveless, sharing science in an imaginative way, loveless. I mean, I just want to point out, for those of you that are watching that Jane Goodall film, there was that throwaway line where the Austrian fellows said, Oh, we saw this thing in that film, uh, fly from fly fly. What was it? Fly away home, right? Where they created a contraption and the birds followed, right? So he saw that in a fiction. Aha! And then that happened. That nonsense. That's unbelievable. I mean, it's amazing. So this is where I want to also get back into this idea of fiction. Like, what is the power of how we can place things in fiction stories that are not necessarily climate pieces that can ignite or normalize uh, certain behaviors or actions or imagination um, to, to also be helping us in this climate work we need to do. So um, one of the things I'd asked all the panel panelists to come up with is what would you love to see on a screen that you've never seen before that you think could help support the growth of climate stewardship? Does anybody have something they want to start with? Go, oh, Charlene, she's just, you can tell. Go ahead, you, you can speak a little more. Well, a, a hint to it for me as well is in the, and I'm sorry if you weren't here for the Jane Goodall film, but they they showed this one scene where they had kind of like an imprint of many, many, many bison returning to the land, like what was possible. And and literally like we, we, we have to kind of plant those seeds of possibility. Um, she's like, you can see it, right? And I think again, we forget that unless we, you know, it's right here, we don't think it exists. And so we limit our imagination. So one of the stories that I'm having a lot of fun writing into right now is, is a few different things. Um, one is, you know, uh, imagine that you are, you are every age of yourself in this moment at this one time. I'm just as much my 12-year-old self as I am my six-year-old self as my 53-year-old self. Time, time is what we think it is. So maybe take it another step further. Um, guides and ancestors, whatever your beliefs are, they're around us all the time. We think we're so alone in all this, but really we're so supported in all this, but we're not taught those types of things. So what if that was tied into it? I think playing with, um, we just happen to be born in a certain space and time in a certain you know, country or environment that taught us these certain things. We live in this little box right now. We live in this little box that, we, that, that, that is what we think it is. And so the film that I'm, I'm playing with is multi-generational, multi it's, it's multi-dimensional. It's really just having us think beyond 
what we believe is possible right now. And it's kind of stretching the imagination. So um, lots of lessons and learnings from different guides along the way. And again, I guess tying it back into our behaviors is it's got to start with the, the mindset shift first. The behaviors follow. I actually look at that back to the investing um, example is I look at it investing as an indication if behaviors are changing. I don't look at it as the lead to. So our, our, our practices and our behaviors are the indication of if we are truly changing, not the lead uh, thereof. Don't know if that makes sense. I love the analogous sort of thinking from one industry to another. It's awesome. Uh, Jennifer, what about you? Like, wouldn't I say, what would you as a scientist like to see in a big screen piece of content that isn't necessarily like a climate documentary? I mean, this is sort of big picture and not necessarily focused on the science, but I have a friend who studies economics and she's been teaching me a lot about the scarcity versus abundance mentality. And in the scarcity mentality, we always feel like we don't have enough. So, you know, our house isn't big enough, our car isn't big enough, we don't have enough designer clothes. But in the abundance mentality, we have everything we need. You know, as long as we've got a roof over our head, you know, we're healthy, we've got enough food on our table, that's all we need. I would love to start seeing that portrayed in some of the characters we see in fictional film. Because as long as we have this mentality that we never have enough, we're never going to move away from this mega consumerism that we see. And I think to shows like the Home and Garden Network where, oh, you know, my house is too small because I've got too much stuff, so I need to go buy a bigger house. And um, we really need to move away from that mentality. So it's not one thing, but I think building characters that can emanate the abundance mentality will really help project us forward. The culture shift. Yeah. Lovely. Carmen, do you have something in, that you're holding? Um, in fiction, I can't, kind of hard to, to, okay. to think about that way. But I would say that, you know, the people who are uh, inspiring us today are here. They exist. It's a question of creating dialogue among ourselves. Um, I don't need, we need to invent hope. I think he's with us. We need to, you know, open ourselves to really, you know, know that he's there. But I, I mean, this this kind of, I, and again, why going back to, you know, becoming even, you know, more aware of becoming more media literate than ever. Because um, you know this sort of idea of, of you know um, I don't know doom is it's, it's it's something we are getting from the media <laughs> you know from each other in this at this moment I feel very connected with everyone at this moment so it, it is you know just uh, yeah we have to really fight against it so why do you feel connected right here today in this room it's human thing it's, it's you know connection is is it's it's what um, maintained mental health is what keeps us, you know, uh, moving in in a common direction. Is what allows us to, you know, converse across various disciplines, for example. So I'm going to make a hypothesis about that. That part of the reason that maybe there is a feeling of connection in this room, a, is because we've listened to each other a little bit today. We've heard different ideas, and I think we also, the, the bunch of us that were here watching that film, had an emotional experience together. Um, and so when we look at those things that help to create the conditions for people to feel connected and then cross across boundaries and also share ideas and concerns and maybe even, you know, science thing, you know, facts and education and futuring and action, I think we have to say that this is where cultural events have the opportunity to create that electricity in a system to bring people together. Um, and to me, that is the power of culture. That is the medium we are all working in, and we need to be responsible to it. Um, <laughs> I want to hear from you. What would you like to see on a big screen? Something. Well, going back, um, I was just thinking about what you were saying. I think there's a lot of films out there that... Um, they're, they're like, hey, we destroyed the planet. Have a great day. You know, they end, but there's no actual sense of what can I do. So we feel the sense of hopelessness and apathy, and then we want to tune out of that. And there's a lot of that happening now, especially, right? 
I think that we have to, as creators, also think about the mental health of our society and try to bring, give people one thing they can do because we just can't continue down the path of like the hopelessness is making people sick. It's tuning people out. So whether it's fiction or nonfiction, try to give some hope and something they can do because we all want to do something, right? I mean, just how, where do we start? There's so many systems, you know, we got to chip away at them to make things better for everyone. I love what you said there. And there's something in it, if I can try and make meaning of what you said, paraphrase it, is it the care for our audience, our duty of care of our audience, of what are we leaving them with at the end of our content? And how do we design our content to make them a better person. It's a little Mr. Rogersy. if any of you have seen the Mr. Rogers stuff, but the, the, how do we actually use the medium to make those people who are at the other end of watching it bigger, better, stronger, and more likely to be working together around particularly, we're talking climate stewardship, it could be any social issue but climate stewardship particularly. Um, I want to go back to this conversation of length. And Carmen, in our pre-conversation, you said something about how content is so important right now because journalism and news is sort of on a, you know, less and less are we getting funded and cared for journalism and news. And so in a way, what is the responsibility of all the other storytellers and media makers to help hold up a certain level of integrity in our society. But um, do you wanna, any of you wanna jump in and talk about length, shorts, hour longs, features, series, why, what forms, for what? Anybody have an opinion? Well, I'll, just, I'll kick it off. Like I think if we're talking behavioral change, I think if we're talking about um, yeah, re rebuilding hope, shorts, um, you know, redefining what a commercial is, public service announcements, a trailer. So, you know, Jane Goodall's film, all I kept thinking was, does everyone know about this? How are people, you know, where, where are the brands that are partnering to make sure that this is fully activated across the world, that people actually know by little snippets on our phones as much as the snippets that we do see that we're like, oh my gosh, if I see this one more time today. So the best content is like filmmakers are doing an incredible job, but unless we know that those 45 or 75 or 90 minute stories exists, only half the job is, you know. So for me, it's, I really believe in destroying what commercials have meant in the past about buying more stuff and reinstating a new level of public service announcements. Um, yeah, what that might be in the next couple of decades. Oh my God, I can't wait to see your channel. <laughs> I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna watch this before going to bed, so much better. <laughs> I also wanna say this, like you're saying there's distribution, right? How does our content find audiences? And I'm just gonna do another shout out. Um, you mentioned Tamo, Tamo Campos. Uh, Tamo Campos and Jasper Rosen Snow made a film called The Klebana Keepers um, about indigenous land protection. And I just wanna say this week it crossed over the 100 mark so that it's had over 100 community screenings. We're not talking people buying tickets and going to a theater. We're talking the film going into community and then always having discussions and dialogues after. And that film is creating an incredible, incredible um, energy for uh, elder land protectors, indigenous land protectors, inspiring and bringing up young, younger youth who want to like into land protection kind of roles and skills. It is going from indigenous nation to indigenous nations and nations are speaking about supporting each other in land protection. It, this film is doing just amazing work out there. And it's not about showing it in theaters or on broadcast, you know, for conventional revenue and commercialization. So the potential of content is, and what we can do with it, with a little love and creativity and funding, is immense um, in very alternative ways. Um, length, do anybody else wanna talk about length or series? 
Carmen, like what was it like to be able to cover a series? <laughs> Hard work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's, a series is is it's, it's complex. It's it, it takes kind of like a, over your entire brain, and uh, heart and life and time and everything else. So but um, obviously allowed you to cover a lot more stories, right? A lot more stories and 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 to understand something that's you know more more yeah yeah to have more space to understand it, more time to understand it, more smaller nuggets to digest them, and you know for the audience to because of Obviously, everything begins with you. You have to understand it first. So question everything. Question <laughs> everything. Right. Okay, so we have the complexity longer form. We have the reinventing of commercials. Um, what's your take? Length, what's your favorite? What do you think does good job, good work? For me, I'm just a conduit for the story generally. So it's as short as we can possibly make it without excluding essential elements. That's cool. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And uh, my target audience is always um, racist climate deniers. So if they're happy with it, they can sit through it, then uh, the rest is easy. Okay, so what do you do to make content for racist climate deniers? Like, what do you have to take into consideration so that they will watch your piece? Oh my God, you're going to make my heart pound. <laughs> um, <ooh>. <laughs> <laughs> The last film I did is called Hani Toch, Our Food Table for the Gitniao Hereditary Chiefs. And I literally disguised it as a, it's a human rights film disguised as a nature film. Only because, and I'm hard as pounding saying this because, how do you say that these people have a right to exist in place, appreciate them, please don't kill them, please don't steal their land, and please don't destroy their land. So that's my job, to make it interesting. So I gotta film grizzly bears up close and do all these things because we haven't gotten it yet, right? So if, if it's a nature film, we can get to the part that we need to see and understand the human cost of greed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we see at Story Money Impact is people say, I made this film uh, because I wanted to get more people on board with um, you know, uh, watersheds, protecting watersheds. But everybody they put in the film, the music they put in the film, and the way they structured the film is for those people who are already converted to protecting watersheds. They don't actually think that, how do I make a tool, like what you're saying, that will actually inspire or make a different audience feel invited and welcomed into the issue. And I think that's one of the things where genre crossing and genre flipping, you know, where we see even like Afrofuturism and indigenous futurism, or we see metaphorical horror films or comedies, or even like, to me, like it cracks me up that Glee, the series Glee became the thing that made nerds and misfits feel cool and like they could sing and dance, you know? Um, like what happened with the whole bullying issue in the US after Glee came out, you know? So what are our cultural mechanisms if we have an intention for social change or climate change or ju climate justice? How, what are we putting and how are we constructing our content so that we're not just putting all these resources for the same audience, but we're actually going, who's not here yet because they, ha they don't feel they belong? What music, what language, what faces, how many close-up grizzly bears do we have to put in so that they can feel that they can be welcomed into the content, challenged maybe, but they're a part of this story too. Can you talk about that for science? The point of view of science? Yeah, I mean, I think there's very few people in the world that really emotionally connect with science. Uh, I may be one of them, 
Not that many people do. So when a filmmaker puts science in the center of a story, it makes it really hard for most people to connect to that story. And I think, you know, we naturally connect to people, right? And we naturally connect to people's stories. And if you can have, a, you know, somebody telling that story that you can emotionally connect to on behalf of science, then it makes it a much stronger story. Lovely. Totally lovely. Okay, I'm kind of hogging it up here. I've got more, but I also think there's a lot of really smart people out there. And so if anybody has questions, I want you to have a chance to ask them. So um, really coming back to that science and climate and storytelling and culture as a tool and audience and how do we get things out there. So until somebody has a question and I'm watching, where the hell do we get the money? How do we fund this? Please. Anyone, ideas, answers. Do we go to that investment community and we say, hey, you know how you guys like invest in futures? Guess what? We got a story about that. <laughs> invest in it. Like, where do we go? How do you get your work fan funded? What do you suggest? And who do we need to talk to? I, I can jump in and say that most science grants from federal organizations have a small budget for outreach. And traditionally, that's gone to science communicators who are really scientists that think they know how to communicate, but they really don't know how to communicate. <laughs> and this group desperately need help. So I think that's where you get the partnership is by, you know, there, there are funds available, but um, you need to build those relationships. So I want to like go and meet a bunch of scientists. How do I do that? Like, where do I look? Where's the dating app for like, <laughs> I'm a filmmaker, I'm a media maker, and I need to find scientists. Like, wh where do I go? Do I call up university departments and ask who's doing research? Like, what do I do? Just like it's been hard for me to crack into the art scene. It's really hard. Like, we're yeah. so siloed. Um, it's something we're hoping our festival can do, but we're just a small festival. Um, Create a BC, Telefilm, <laughs> CMF, CMPA. I see an event to organize here. Yeah, okay. Thanks. <laughs> How else do you get your work funded? Any of you. You all made work. How did you do it? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm in the future in this one. So the media visionary is talking at this moment. Um, I'm pulling everything that I learned from the impact investment industry, like any industry. I mean, I am so grateful for the types of funding available in Canada. Um, I, I work with filmmakers that do not live in Canada, and they are just, they are astounded. At, at what we have available to us. Um, but, and, as any industry, we must be di diversified in what we're, you know, in what we're trying to do. If we're really trying to build a, a, an industry that's, that is trajectory shifting for seven generations from now, we would be irresponsible if we weren't diversifying our revenue streams. And so, um, I'm turning over every every coconut, and that is from philanthropists and foundations to impact investors that want to get ahead of the curve and upstream on behavior shifting um, that will actually lessen the need for impact investments in the future as challenges ha you know change to um, brands who want to continue to fund good content and amplify it. So I'm going to double click on something there. I have had my whole career in independent media, and last year, a foundation offered to send me to a social finance conference in San Francisco, and I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? I went, and I just want to say, there is a huge social finance movement out there of that if we start to speak the right language around ESGs and SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and if we start to actually position our content as a tool and an asset, and is that we are about what you said, behavior change. We are a part of our content is about behavior change to do good in the world that is going to help prevent future costs to governments and to, like there is a whole kind of new language that we can start to learn. It's, we've got an uphill climb. But when I say, who do we need to talk to? I think our industry actually needs to have a little task force learning this language and starting to go out and speaking to all those different funds and saying, you're missing out if you're not investing in culture. So just saying. Money, where else? I could um, uh, tell you about my experience, yes, but please. I'm a little bit of a cheater 
Okay, we like cheaters. They find fast ways to do things. Right. <laughs> because I do everything myself in the film aspect. Like, it's, it's just... Their costs for working with my production company are a lot lower. I find that... Uh, and NGOs, they need these... They have actually money to spend on these things. So I actually have a commercial aspect of my work. I do work, all kinds of work for, like, say, like Nature Conservancy or even UN IPCC and different organizations that hire me to make films and I have all this fancy equipment and the skills anyway and then I can lend them to wherever I want so I can tell my do go like rogue operator if I want to and then I'll, I've also built great relationships with different indigenous nations that need um, that are actually trying to shift policy like change the racist Min mineral tenure act that allows companies to steal indigenous land without their consent for instance and there's some like there's different organizations behind that so they can pool money like a mining watch and all these different ones, right? And then you can, they p can put that together and you can be, uh, make your film, right? So I found it, like, a, there's, I think there's a huge demand, I think there's a huge demand in this area where I'm sitting. Especially if you're aware of the, of the policies and you're kind of a nerd and you do the homework and you earn your stripes and then more opportunities come, right? They just find you and they're like, hey, we want to hire you. That's where I'm at almost, kind of. Yeah, I think you're a bit of a, yeah. And Pete Mitchell earlier spoke about being a B Corp. I'm sure we also have other equipment houses and companies that also, for part of their corporate social responsibility piece, may want to help support, lend their equipment, their gear, their editing systems, their, you know, out to also balance out the idea of instead of cash budgets in kind. There's a lot of this kind of that, that also helps for you to stand in the space of what am I doing about what are we collectively as a company doing about climate? Um, not just in terms of your emissions and your internal behavior, but what are you also helping other people do? Thanks. Um, I'll try to make it really quick. I wrote down my thoughts because I know we're running out of time, but um, obviously everyone on the panel is doing amazing work in the storytelling element, and you started off with a really great kind of opening about how storytelling is that missing piece. I kind of have a question just around, and I don't know, this can be for you know networking later on, but the idea around like that storytelling element, clearly there is, that's a big missing piece and a big part of like reaching the masses and so on. It's very important. And I say this, like clearly this work is working because you're seeing organizations like oil and gas companies co-opting the storytelling to create things like, I don't know, whatever it is, Pathways Alliance and stuff where they're trying to rebrand themselves as necessary. I guess my question is, what do you do as you know, folks that are all involved in the media world? You've got advertising dollars. You've got all these kinds of things. Like, you know, a lot of organizations will have like, oh, we don't support certain kinds of organizations that you know, warmongers and so on. But where do you draw that line, and can you kind of up that ante with some of these, you know, organizations that are trying to rebrand themselves when they're really just pushing forward the wrong agendas? Okay, can I ask if this is your question? Is your qu question? Do you take money from companies that want to be associated with you, but you may not want to be associated with them? Kind it's of? not so, I'm, I'm sure no one really is up here, especially yeah. given the many of the people in this room, but there are so many big organizations that are having these advertising dollars thrown at them and maybe not really looking into what's being said. Have any of you had to deal with this? Go ahead, let's hear from you. If your heart pounds, I gotcha, buddy, I gotcha. <laughs> right here. Early in, um, I actually did quite a lot of work with the David Suzuki Foundation, and there was one guy who had defected to be a strategic advisor for Kinder Morgan. And he tried to pull me in. And there was big money for me to do. He proposed it and I said, go to hell. Does that work? <laughs> cool. <laughs> I can see there's going to be a little corner conversation in the lobby. Because <laughs> I think there's some really, really good things to that. One, yes, question. And I'm so sorry, Melanie. You can kill me later. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I feel like there's a lot of people out there that want to give money, but they don't know what cause to give it to. And I don't know where or how you can find them, but LinkedIn seems to come to mind. Because I watched a, a video recently. If you're on LinkedIn, you'll notice that you probably get a lot of in-mail that is annoying, and it's just the same thing repeated for every single person. And nobody's using a story to get your attention. So if you can find a way to find people on LinkedIn that have interests in the stories that you want to tell, and then you see their LinkedIn page, and you see what they're liking, 
and then you send them a personal message about what they're liking in an exciting way, and then you share with them what you're working on. I think that if you hit them personally in the heart, that might trigger them to answer you and open their pocketbook. <coughs> Donor development. <laughs> Um, thank you. Love it. The power of LinkedIn and finding people with common, what I'm going to summarize is common values. It doesn't have to be those in your neighborhood, but actually finding people of common values and then building relationship with them around support. Okay. I feel like there's so much. We only caught like the first few questions, but is there's anything you want to say, just a one liner around all these people in this room who you have their attention and this idea of climate and story last words, final words, um, and then we'll close out and say everything else happens in the lobby. Carmen's going for her mic. Question everything. <laughs> I love it. She's all about the fake news. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Jennifer? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think to, we're all going to have to work together, including the big corporations, you know, to actually get to where we need to go. Every single person in this world is going to have to be on the same page. And if we are all fighting each other, it's not going to happen. So I hope we can start working together more, more closely. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm going to pull that thread through and say, um, find our commonalities. I think we all want our children and our grandchildren to um, have hope for the future. And um, when we can rally around a commonality and get excited about it, things happen. Um, and step fully into how important your role is right now in this industry. It's the most important role that I can think of. Just anything I want to say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think that obviously media is one of the most important um, ways we can change the world uh, in a better way. I want to believe that the world has changed in a better way, but we need to do better as people and come together. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Melanie, everybody, thank you. I'm going to do a shameless plug, just because I it. have to. We're in the middle of a monthly donor campaign, tax receipts and all, storymoneyimpact.com, doing impact work with social justice and environmental justice content. Go there. One latte a month helps us out. Thank you.